it's official, guys. We have a start date for the NBA, uh, December 22nd. You've probably caught me on social media a little bit this morning already. Uh, I am a happy, happy guy right now. I think we knew this was coming for a couple of days, but, man, it's great to have it finalized like this. Yeah, man, it's, it's exciting. Uh, like, it's coming soon. And I feel like it was almost necessary that they did it this way. Otherwise, the effects of, of this season will linger on forever. Like, the faster you can start next season, even though I, I get it, it's tough, you know, the sooner, you know, hopefully in a couple of seasons from now, the effects of COVID-19 and this season will be fully gone and we'll be back to normal seasons. And I get it. It's tough on guys like Danny Green. Yeah, you're an older player. You had a quick turnaround. I'm sorry, but you're like one guy. And we talked about this the other day. Like, you're like one dude. The younger guys are going to be just fine. Uh, LeBron's a cyborg. He'll be just fine. Uh, Jimmy Butler, this might be rough on him because he was playing – you know, 49 minutes and 48 minute games down the stretch, but it's only a handful of guys who are going to have this quick turnaround. There's other guys in the NBA who haven't played in eight months. You don't think they're itching to get out there and like excited to play. And we talked about it. Like, yes, it's personal for us because like, this is our livelihood, but like we're one of like hundreds of thousands of people who are directly affected by this situation. You just kind of need life to get back to normal a little bit. Yeah. Agreed. hundred percent agreed all the way around. Uh, one of our, most active customers, a gentleman by the name of Ryan Monks, was uh, we were talking back and forth yesterday, and he's like, "Hey, man, you got to be so happy it's coming back." I'm like, "Yeah, broken board is no way to go through life, and when you don't have any sports to talk about and you have nothing to watch at night, uh, like I was starting to feel it last weekend. Like I was getting itchy, and for the last few months, like I'd been busy with sports, and I was having a little part time work on the side, and all that went away. I'm like." It's like the start of lockdown again, and I am freaking losing my mind. I am so bored and just ready to watch sports more often. Yeah, I will say, like, having college sports that I watch makes it a lot better, you know, because I was going to say college basketball starts in 20 days. But that abs- literally means nothing to you. I was going to say that earlier in the video, but that has no effect on you at all. College it doesn't football- mean anything for making money either. Well, yeah, that's true, uh, especially if you're not betting on it. But uh, at least it's something to watch. It's true. I might have even started watching a little bit more college ball. Uh, probably not, but maybe just a little bit. So before we start talking, and we're just going to shoot the shit on the NBA a little bit, guys. This is an unplanned video. We don't have, you know, we're going to go through some trades and free agents, predictions for what's going to go on, like the upcoming seasons and stuff like that. Uh, I do want to mention, uh, I said it on Instagram this morning. I tweeted it out. In honor of the NBA being back, we're going to take five customers today, annual customers, which is a full-on membership from the 6th of November right now to the 6th of November next year. Half off. It's about as good of a deal as you'll ever find through us. Got a couple of them already, so there's only going to be a few spots available left. Welcome aboard, Rob, Derek, and uh, we'll, so we'll take a few more. If you want to pay through the website, the link is below. We'll send you a reimbursement by the end of the day, probably almost directly when we're done with this video. Uh, if you want to pay manually, there's a Venmo and PayPal address below as well. It's 100 bucks. It gets you all the sports, not just NBA. Uh, we'll talk about maybe doing an NBA only package but there's no decisions made on that yet it's about as good of a deal as you're going to get from us we're just excited for the season to start so let's go out and get it uh i am we'll probably even cover the nba preseason a little bit this year because there's some time uh even though i hate the nba preseason for dfs it just gives us something to do yeah listen normally i don't even know when's preseason nba normally i have no idea Uh, october so, like, baseball's going on or something's normally going on besides just preseason NBA. But this year, kind of, as we've learned, you kind of got to get out of your comfort zone a little bit and expand your horizons. Yeah, man, we got – I. it's a tougher one to evaluate, right, because, like, you don't get good information. You've got to start following beat writers and try to get your best guess on who's actually going to be in the game. It is not an exact science. It's probably definitely – better serve for GPPs, but I forgot to mention this this morning. One of our highest viewed videos of all time was an NBA preseason video featuring like the Boston Celtics playing against somebody else from a couple of years ago. Uh, It was a terrible video, but like 7,000 people watched it because people were desperate to play DFS, and I get that. I totally get that. That's funny. I only remember making a few of those. Specifically, I remember talking about Kevin Knox. Kevin Knox. Yeah, it's, it's been a few hot minutes right here. So uh, let's just kind of do like a quick like Eastern Conference preview about who we think maybe like the movers and the shakers are going to be, uh, you know, what we think teams are going to do. 
Uh, I don't think we have to focus on some of these, you know, kind of the bottom feeders right now. Like the Detroit Pistons are going to be bad. We know it. The New York Knicks are going to be bad. We know it and so on and so on. Um, I mean, we can start at the top with my Milwaukee Bucks. You know, the big thing going for Milwaukee right now is I feel like they got to make a move to be a little bit different next year. And my favorite idea, and I don't know how they get it done, because I, I, I keep hearing the last couple of days, Devin Booker will uh, Phoenix. I think he would be the perfect pairing with Giannis. It's kind of, kind of a one-two combo. Because Booker's strengths are Giannis's weaknesses and vice versa. Like, you can a guy who can make a bucket down the stretch. That's what Devin Booker does. He is a bucket getter. And as a, I'll give you everybody but Giannis to make that happen. I feel like that would be a perfect pairing. Yeah, so do I. But I think that anyone who's saying that's living in fantasy land just don't see it happening. Don't see Booker getting dealt at all, especially without the Bucs having like a really high draft pick, which is, you know, I was hearing that, that Phoenix was turning down offers, you know, like the number one, number two pick and some, et cetera. I just don't know if the Bucs have what the Suns would would want to would want at all, especially considering Bledsoe is probably a non-starter for them. I, I'll agree with you in that. I think the Bucs need to make a move, if for nothing else, than to change the narrative and to show Giannis that they're willing to make a move. More important than winning this year is re-signing Giannis, in my opinion. So you got to do everything you can, everything he wants, in order to give you a chance to re-sign him. If that means you know trading off the guys now to, to go for a title this year, do it. I, I mean, I'm letting Giannis decide like every decision I make if I'm Milwaukee. Did you... Uh... So our buddy DFS Patriot sent us a link that Giannis is preparing. Like, even though he, like, he's under contract for the rest of this year, and he's not going to re-sign his max contract this year. It makes no sense for him financially. Like, he's like, yeah, this, he's prepared to sign him like Miami. Like, the season hasn't even played out yet. Like, I, I get articles sent to me every three days by a customer. Somebody saying about Giannis is going to be a warrior. He's going to be a Laker. Like, let's let the season play out just a little bit. And, yes, I, I, we went back with the tweet, like, Every team would trade their lesser assets for him. Like, let's let the season play out before we figure out where he ends up. I'll say this. In order for him to re-sign with the Supermax in Milwaukee, he needs to do it before the season. He cannot do it during the season. So I think it's important for them to make moves before the season and try to get him to sign. Then I don't see them dealing him no matter what, but they're going to have to go all out in order to keep him. And whatever that means. It's tricky, though, man, because it's like, you know, I think that part of what could appeal to tr- like trade partners for the Bucks are like future first round picks that are unprotected. But those, like, I don't know if I'm moving those if I'm Milwaukee in the off chance Giannis leaves. If you're Milwaukee, he's essentially has to tell you, like, I'm probably out of here. And you also have to have a good trade on the table because dealing. you don't get other superstars coming here, no. right? Like this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for a two-time MVP. The last time you saw the Bucks with a dominant player like this, I was literally not even born yet. And he went by the name of Lou Alcindor. So it's been, uh, you know, the term hot minute, it's been a shitload of those. For sure. Uh, I was just more saying about trading to put pieces around him. Yeah, I... Uh, if you got some good deals, I think you got to take some chances right here uh, because it's not 100% working, obviously, in the playoffs. And I know there's no, like, exact answer on what's going to work. And you can blame COVID last year and the break, if whatever you want to do. You can blame Miami for playing, for playing like, the second-best team in the NBA after that because you lost to a team that played the Lakers more competitively. You can say all those things, but uh, it would make some sense to at least make some minor adjustments at the very least. Yeah, I think the big problem is that, like, Bledsoe's value is shot. I mean, I don't know who wants him at this point. And I think that it's kind the of – de- Yeah, right? I think it's, like, delusions of grandeur to think, like, the Milwaukee can just, like, package Bledsoe and DiVincenzo and get, like, whoever they want. Like, I'm not giving up Bradley Beal for that if I'm Washington. No. Um you move on from Bledsoe right now, you're getting him at a very low premium. He's yes. looked about as bad in the playoffs. The best time would have been when he was playing some really good basketball in the regular season, which is just has, not something that we have in our recent memory right now. And the guy you want to hold on to is Middleton, but he's one of the one guy who probably has some value to actually trade. So you, how do you really use him to get something better? Exactly. It's like almost like do you want to cut off your nose to spite your face and dealing those guys. It is a – conundrum because 
you're right. They were really good. Like before COVID hit and before all the weird stuff happened, I've heard that, you know, I've read from a couple of places. They have been interested in Bogdanovich from Sacramento and potentially Oladipo um, from Indiana. I mean, I get it, but I don't see either of those guys as like perfect fits. The only thing I could say about Oladipo, and I don't think he's a perfect fit, is I also think you're getting him at a low point right now. So, I mean, it was, was it like a year and a half ago? We were talking about, yeah, we're talking about Victor Oladipo as an, as an emerging superstar. Bad injury. He wasn't very good down the stretch last year, and that's probably a big part of the injury. So it's a gamble I kind of like, but there's no guarantee he's ever that dude. If you're Brooklyn, do you deal Levert for Oladipo? If I'm Brooklyn, you like, know what I do if I'm Brooklyn. I deal Kyrie. Assuming you're trying to get a third, like assuming like your goal is to either keep Levert or get another third, you know, someone better than Levert to pair with Kyrie and Durant. Like I think Levert might be better than Oladipo right now is my point. This could be recency bias, but I'm a thousand percent with you because Levert's a baller. I told you last year during the playoffs, and I think you and I were both kind of man crushing on Levert down the stretch of the NBA season for good reason. This kid can ball. Uh, I want to get rid of Kyrie if, I, if it's me, if I'm the Brooklyn Nets, because I think Kyrie is not a good pairing with Kevin Durant. Now, Kevin Durant wouldn't sit well with this because these two are buddies and that's yeah, not like going to work with them. Like, yeah, that's why they played well. You don't have to sign there, excuse me. So it's but not I right. think I from it. a basketball perspective, having this team moving on from Kyrie and being Karis LeVert, Kevin Durant, and whatever sucker you can get to take on Kyrie and give you something for it, man, that's a team that I like a lot better because I just don't like – Well, I'd rather have Karis LeVert with the ball in his hand. I'm glad that – because I, I was going to say right when you started the East, I think that we got to put Brooklyn into right at the top of the East. But before we get there, one other guy I just want to ask you about from Milwaukee, a guy I think they could get, you know, they'd have to give a lot. But I think that he's right below like the peel tier, Drew Holiday. Yeah, I like Drew Holiday as a player. I don't – know how well he fits with Milwaukee. And I say that because he's not much of a floor spreader. You know, he's not a terrible three-point shooter, but he's not like, he's not somebody you respect on the three-point line. He does fit the defense that's nasty. Yeah, like a slightly better Bledsoe, yeah. Yeah, and like Bledsoe, before he came to, like, I think that, yeah, I mean, you got to have a certain skill set to play with Giannis or to maximize Giannis' skill set, I should say. Which is exactly why Brooke Lopez is not really somebody that you can trade because right. his value on Milwaukee is just greater than it is anywhere else because he's exactly what the Bucks need. They need a stretch five. Now, I mean, if you can upgrade him to Carl Anthony Towns, great, but that's just not something that's realistically going to happen. Yeah, exactly. So, all right, I think Milwaukee is – I want to see what they do going into next year. They still have, you know – Let's touch on the Nets. Let's go right into it. Yeah, I was going to say, how high do you put the Nets going into the year? Because I put them pretty high. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where, but, you know, anytime you get a, a guy like Kevin Durant healthy, you got to put them in the upper echelon. Well, Kevin Durant's health is the big question then, right? Because, you know, I know Max and like Stephen A, for example, have gone on and on and on about this one. And that is, what do you think about an aging superstar coming off of an Achilles injury? Is he the Kevin Durant that we last saw, who is probably the second best player in the game of basketball? Or is he 80% of what he once was? Because that's typically what's happened to guys, you know, older guys coming off of Achilles injuries. So until we see that, there's no way for me, you, or anybody else in the world to really answer this question effectively. If Kevin Durant is what he was when he left, I mean, I think the Nets are right there with Milwaukee and maybe Boston as the team's most likely to come out of the East. And Miami, I guess, once again as well. You got to put Miami right there. And depending on what Philly does, I mean, I think they're going to be right there again. So the East, all of a sudden, when you add one other really good team like the Nets, all of a sudden the East is good. You got That's seven, interesting at the very least. Well, you've got seven teams right there, you know, including Orlando, that are like pretty much locked into the playoffs unless something, you know, really bad happens for those teams. You know what I mean? Right. So – I've said this since they signed them together. I just don't flat out think Kyrie and Kevin Durant are the proper pairing. Neither one of them is like A-plus passers. They're not bad passers. Like I'm not saying Kyrie is like the worst distributor of all time. But as far as point guards go, 
Like he's just he's not a plus passer. He doesn't have that LeBron James like gift of being able to just see the floor. He's more interested in putting in the bucket. And the same goes for Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant's a solid defender, you know, but he's not Kyrie, you know, Kawhi in his prime or anything like that. Uh, I love Karis Levert, uh, as we've kind of discussed already, but I just get the feeling like where are his touches coming in this offense? Yeah, I know. He's definitely gonna have to be like that guy off the bench or yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I feel like he's a guy, like, I would love for Cleveland to deal, like, everything for Levert, and he'd be, like, the guy on Cleveland. I think Levert has, like, superstar potential. Um, I don't disagree with you about the Kyrie and Durant pairing. I will say, though, from what I've heard, like, this pretty much will be Durant's team. And, like, it's almost like Cleveland with LeBron and Kyrie. And it wasn't like Kyrie cost Cleveland in those years. Kyrie played really well with LeBron. It got to, it never even got to be a problem. Kyrie just wanted out. He wanted out, though, because he was sick of being the second fiddle, right? Like he wanted his own team. Do you think because he's he likes Kevin Durant more than he seems to like LeBron that he'll be satisfied in this role? Maybe, yes, I do. I, I can't answer that, like, for certain, but I think it's oh. a possibility. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so, I, I wouldn't expect you to answer that for sure because I think that's impossible for any of us to do that. I mean, that's a tough question, though. It's I mean, interesting. I think that he, you know, what you're, when you sign with Kevin Durant, who even Kyrie knows is better than him because it's Kevin Durant. Like, you know that you're not going to be like the number one guy. Kyrie probably couldn't handle it in Boston because he thought he was better than all those guys. Maybe. Uh, I think that's possible. And it, he could also go into this thinking he's fine with it. And True. then in 30 games, realize he's not. I completely agree. Um, so... After, all right, I agree. Brooklyn's such a wait and see. They've got potential to win the title. They could also be like the seven or eight seed, depending on health and how they play together. Yeah. Um, I mean, if Kevin Durant, you know, Kevin Durant, the guy that we know, like, I, I mean, this team could easily well, be the best team. Yeah. He'll win games against the lesser teams, like, consistently, you know, in the league. If it's Kevin Durant, like, that we know. Kevin Durant and Kyrie, you know. Teams, a lot of these lesser teams won't be able to score with those guys. So yeah, and I don't think they need much around them if it's those two. And again, if they get LeBron. LeBron can really have a big part of this team, they got a center in Jared Allen who has no desire. He doesn't need the ball. He'll play defense and he'll block shots. You know, he'll clean up, you know, clean off the glass and everything like that. I think they, you know, they got you know, whatever, Joe Harris or whatever else on the wing to, you know, shoot three pointers and stuff yeah. like that. I think they're pretty well constructed already. Same, like, I'll say this, I in the regular season, I think they could cruise to a lot of wins. If they're healthy, obviously, if, if things are playing in their favor. That doesn't mean I think they're necessarily going to come out of the East, though. But I do think yeah. that that's up for them, where they could be, like, you know, the number one or two seed, because a lot of teams just won't be able to score with them in the regular season. For sure. Uh I look at the Pacers now as a team that I've really enjoyed what they've done the last few years. Uh, now I got a new coach coming in, which I don't like that move at all. I thought they overachieved. I don't know how you do that, but I just kind of look at them as a non-factor anymore. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that they're probably destined to make a move or multiple moves where they change things up, whether it's Oladipo, Miles Turner. Uh, I don't know. Indiana seems out of place fourth right here. I don't expect them to be there next year. I will say when you brought up like, you know, Milwaukee, Toronto, Boston, you, you kind of hesitated with Miami. Do you not think Miami will be right there next year? Or is it just kind of like they're the more it was a slip of the mind. Okay. I mean, um, I'm not sure I expect Miami to be there next year. I, at least this far. I know Miami had this wonderful playoff run. I think that the bubble certainly helped them. Butler is a star, but I still don't think he's like a superstar, superstar. And maybe he'll continue to prove me wrong. Well, let's see what they do in the off season as well. Because one of the guys that's a free agent is Goran Dragic. And I think Goran Dragic proved throughout the playoffs that he was well utilized in Miami, you know, kind of save him as an older player, as a six man, don't run him for big minutes, but he can still absolutely ball come playoff time. And I think he could be a great piece. Like, I think he would be a great addition to the Milwaukee Bucks, especially if you were somehow able to, unload like an Eric Bledsoe because he's a guy who can get you a bucket a little bit once in there. I think he's a big part of Miami. Is Tyler Hero like a flash in the pan or is he like a legitimate rising star? I think there's a lot of questions still right there. Yeah. I don't poo-poo any of your points. I think there's a lot to go over here. But the other thing, like 
Bam's a stud. I know you are a monster Bam fan. Like Bam is a rising superstar as well. So that I'm glad you mentioned that about Hero because that brings me to a question I was going to ask. If you're Miami, would you do a Hero straight up basically for Drew Holiday? No. I like Drew Holiday a lot, but I think he has to be in the right situation because once again, if it's Drew Holiday, Bam, and Jimmy Butler, and now I got three guys in my starting lineup and none of them can shoot threes, like, I, I just don't like that construction in, in the NBA in 2021. Yeah, I agree. Oh, man, Hero would be so good on New Orleans still. Yeah, he'd be a great fit right there, no doubt about it, because they need somebody who can shoot threes. I just don't think Holiday is the right fit for Miami, even though I'm a monster Drew Holiday fan. Yeah, I get it. I feel like Hero in today's NBA is a good fit with just about anyone. Yes. That, no arguments here, because anybody that can shoot it with his effectiveness, he's a bucket getter. He's a freaking child, so he's only going to get older and better, in my opinion. Yeah. I like Tyler Hero. He's from Wisconsin, so you know he's got a you know, nice little cut to his jib right there. But still, I, I think he works for pretty much any team. I agree. Uh, just in what capacity, right? And I also agree that I wouldn't deal him for Drew Holiday. I'd really consider it for Bradley Beal, obviously, and I'd do it for Booker. But Hero's the type of guy like you don't trade. Yeah, it's got to be, you know, I was thinking about this as I was driving my kids over to their mom's house and just kind of what we were going to talk about. And teams have to fit together. And I was just going back to, I always referenced the Miami Heat with Chris Bosh, Dwayne Wade, and LeBron, like, like, they were so talented, but they just never made sense, the three of them together. You got to get guys that make sense together. And Drew Holiday does – he can be good anywhere, but how you use him, he's got to be on the right team. Yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly, especially because he's not, like, a great three-point shooter, which, I mean, just – change. which is why I hold, like, Booker and Beal in much higher regard because that's really important now. Um, like, I would love Drew Holiday on the Denver Nuggets. You know, pair him with Murray in that backcourt right there. Yes. Got a couple of pseudo point guards, but I got a bucket getter in Murray. I got excellent passers in Jokic already, so I can run the offense through three different guys. Uh, I let Jamal Murray cook on offense while Drew Holiday plays lockdown defense, but he can also still go out and get you a bucket. I surround him with some shooters at the three and the four. I think that's a good basketball team. I agree with that. Um, all right, speaking of two other basketball, good basketball teams, though, that kind of get – you know, they've been there, done that. Boston and Philly. So Boston, I think it's prime to make a step up this year. I mean, they were really good last year. I'm not sure their ceiling is that of an NBA title winner, though. Um, I just don't know, man, because we've talked about it. Winning a title is, like, really hard. Think about the teams that have won titles in the past 10 years, and it's like LeBron and the Warriors. That's it. Kawhi. That's yeah, it. with Kawhi getting two hits in there, that's about it. Uh, no, it's not. And – it's not easy, and it's not easy at all. I guess that depends, first and foremost, Boston's looking to make some moves, and we'll see what happens you know, throughout free agency and the trading. This stuff's going to come fast and furious, but what about the acceleration of Jason Tatum, who we saw take a monster step up uh, throughout portions of last year? I mean, this guy's, what, 12 years old? Like the, the sky's the limit for him. If he gets even better next year and he's arguably a top-five player in the NBA, which we saw flashes of, I mean, that's a whole different ball of wax. I agree. I feel like it's the same story with them, though. They they should have made a move, like, in the past couple of years. They never went and got Anthony Davis. I know that, you know, they never traded Tatum, so Tatum has turned into that superstar. But I just feel like it's the same problem as Denver. They've got a lot of very good players. It's actually very similar to Denver for me. They've got a bunch of very good players. One star, like Jokic and Tatum, are on similar levels, in my opinion, in terms of, like, how good they are in the NBA, but neither of them are a LeBron or a Giannis, in my opinion, that can like carry your team to an NBA title. Not well, to, that's like, a problem not, though. Like, there's only so many LeBrons. Well, right, I agree. Um, I agree. That's a fair point, but I don't think. Listen, it's not impossible to take down like a LeBron-led team. I just think you have to be better than Boston. Okay. Well, LeBron's not going anywhere. We know that, right? Not yet, at least. Okay. Uh, even though we're down on Kawhi based on what happened in the bubble, he's not going anywhere. Uh, Giannis isn't going to end up in Boston. Like, 
I mean, I don't know what they could possibly add. Uh, Steph Curry's not going anywhere. So, like, I like Jason Tatum. Can he turn into – because, again, what is he, 21? Something like that. I'm excited to talk over the Warriors now that you just mentioned Yeah, them. they're a really interesting one to get into here, and we'll get to the West Coast not too long. Uh, I, I'm interested to watch Boston during this uh, shortened offseason to see what they can do. You know, you look at some of the free agents. Like, I don't know what they could add to this team right away that makes them competitive. What they need is a big man. But, like, I don't, you know, Andre Drummond seems pretty set on staying in Cleveland, right? He's not letting go of that salary. Yeah, and I don't, I don't really know what, how much of a big ad would he be for Boston anyway. Yeah, I mean, agreed. I think that if they could get him on the cheap, they'd love him. But he, he's making a ton of money, and he's just – they got other guys they want to pay. What about Serge Ibaka? Like, I think he'd be a nice fit in Boston. I think he's underutilized in Toronto. He can shoot the three. He can still play pretty good defense. I think this is an underrated player right here. I'm curious to see where he ends up. I am too. I almost like in the NBA – almost assume that all these guys are going to re-sign with their teams unless I hear elsewhere. I feel like free agency just doesn't happen that much in the NBA where guys move. <laughs> but trades happen every other day. <laughs> right? Yeah, well, the way they set up, like, the, you know, the deals in the NBA. You, yeah, I'm not, I'm not an expert on it either, but it, it, it's oftentimes advantageous to stay where you are. But, um, like, I feel like Serge Ibaka could be, like, a nice piece for a couple of teams out there. I, I mean, good chance he ends up in Toronto. I also feel like Toronto, like, they got their championship. I struggle to see them really competing Okay. with, as currently constructed, with the Milwaukee's, Boston's, Miami's, Brooklyn's, and potentially Phillies of the East. Like, I feel like they could kind of be like Indiana now. Okay. Um I don't know if I agree with that, but I don't disagree with it. I think that I've heard Toronto as a team that wants to keep their options open for next summer because, like, as a possible Giannis destination. And I also don't disagree with you that, as currently constructed, like, they're probably not going to win a title. Fred Van Vliet is, like, the best free agent that could change teams. I've heard that multiple, like, every time I've heard about free agency, that's, like, the guy that is going to, like, set the mark. Toronto couldn't re-sign him. I think they can offer more than anyone, et cetera, but not sure they're going to do it. So he's a big domino to fall. Do you think they should sign Van Vliet to a big deal? God, that's a good question. Um, I mean, so I noticed like as the season progressed last year, you went from being not a big Fred Van Vliet fan to turning into a really big Fred Van Vliet fan. Am I correct there? Yes, you are, but... I still think that he's not the type of guy on any team I want to be paying big money to. I agree with that because, again, as much as we give Kawhi the credit for shutting down my bucks two years ago, it was Fred Van Fleet that shot 100 for 100 from three-point range from game three moving forward, hit every big three you can possibly imagine. And you want to know what? Even though he put up numbers and he helped me win a whole bunch of DFS points or a DFS contest uh, in that series against Boston, like, he didn't play very well. He's still, what, four feet tall and pretty much relying on being an outside shooter? You know, uh, I don't want to pay him big money, like monster money either. Like, I like, we like the cut of his gym, for sure. You've definitely gotten me on him. And, like, I've heard, like, Atlanta as a possible, you know, fit for him because they've got a ton of cap space. And, like, I get that. He's a nice fit there. He's good on defense. He provides some, like, veteran leadership. He's been there, done that. But, like, that team's not winning anything because of Van Fleet. Do you agree with that? Yeah, because now you put him and Trey Young in the backcourt and you got two guys that are under six feet tall. What happens when you play a team with tall guards? And I get it. He's, like, earned his money. But, like, I just personally wouldn't pay him. No, he's got – I wouldn't overpay him. I feel like this okay. is one of those guys, if you want to make, like, an NFL comparison, you know, he's got a great season last year. He's, like, a middle linebacker in a system – where he makes all the tackles and it's a bunch of numbers, but you bring him over, he's just not a, a needle mover. Yeah, exactly. I'm with you. We see that eye to eye. You know, like I maybe he'd be a good fit in Philly if you need outside shooting or something like that. But Philly's obviously another team. There's a lot of moving parts right here. You know, are they? What happens? Are they all in on James Harden? Do we see Harden and Simmons changing teams? It'd be interesting to see what happens here. But uh, pff, who knows? Who knows? Now they got Doc Rivers there. Um, 
who knows? They're one it's hard to really talk about. I definitely think that a move will be made. Whether the most likely move is Horford being dealt. Because Simmons and Embiid were a lot better when Horford was not on the floor. And there's still a market for Horford a little bit. I mean, you just said it. Trades are like more common than free agency. So I could see a team. I don't even know what team making a trade for Horford. Because you know where Horford would be a great fit? Where? Back in Boston. Yeah, I don't hate that. I'm not sure what they'd have to give up, but probably not even a lot. A stretch five, a guy who plays good team defense, a veteran leader. I feel like that's where he would be best suited. He, I know the dude was literally just there, but I feel like that's a team who needs a big man. Um, he's better than, you know, Aaron Baines and Daniel Feast. Not Aaron Baines. Why am I thinking two years ago? But he's better than Daniel Feast and, you know, the other guys I saw coming in off the bench last year. Robert Williams. Canner. Man, remember that game Aaron Feast had last year? Daniel Feast or Aaron Baines? Aaron Baines. I think you said Aaron Thies, so I was confused yeah. for a second. Yeah. And um, that Baines had, that was crazy. So, like speaking 50, of... 60 K uh, points, right? Yeah, insane. Speaking of Boston, uh, a rumor that I've heard that's kind of been talked about for a while now, and this is a guy that's in, been in the rumor mill, is Rudy Gobert. I mean, is Utah giving up on him already? No. It's not that they're giving up on him. He's just in line for a super max deal, and they're not going to pay him that. So it's a matter of whether they can sign, they can come to like some agreement. But on that note, whoever's trading for him will have to sign him to big money. So I don't think Gobert's another one. Like he's a lot like Van Vliet in my eyes, uh, better than Van Vliet. And I'd pay him over. I'd pay Van Vliet. But in today's NBA, like man, uh, he's not a max player. That's for damn no. sure. He's, I, I still think he's slightly overrated from a defensive perspective, too. He does protect the rim, but he can be bullied by bigger big men. Um, no, I – he, yeah, he definitely feels like a guy who could get overpaid because of all the defensive player of the years. And right. I, he doesn't have much offensive game. He most certainly can't stretch the floor, so he only works in a couple kinds of systems. Uh, I won't want to overpay him. You mentioned a guy like Jared Allen, you know, a couple minutes ago now. Like, he basically does everything Gobert does. At a much lower price. Yeah, so I'm with you. And I view him and, and Van Vliet much in the same. Philly's just really hard to talk about. Before we wrap up the East, I know that a lot of these other teams are, like, pretty much irrelevant. <laughs> irrelevant. But is there any one of them that you think takes a big step up, multiple ones? I nope. mean, who do you think is the eighth, eighth seed in the NBA? Well, I think we're going to see these same eight teams. Yeah, geez. Um, I don't know. I don't have anybody out of these outside teams that I have really any hope for doing anything more but maybe squeaking into the eight seed. So I agree. I also, I don't think Washington or not Washington, Orlando will be the eight seed this year. I just don't, I don't know. They could be because all the other teams suck. I think Washington's got a good chance if they keep Beal and if John Wall's relatively healthy. Yeah. Big F, right? Um, I mean, yeah, John Wall is still somewhat of a player. Then they got a really good backcourt and we'll see. Uh, I don't think in the grand scheme of things, though, it doesn't really matter, right? Oh, no. I mean, agreed. None of those teams will be able to, to hang with the top of the East. And I don't know. Yeah, those teams are pretty shitty. So let's just kind of take a look at the Western Conference right away. And I'm going to have to agree with Nick Wright on this. I actually think the shortened season is a nice advantage for the Lakers. And I know people think they're going to be tired and stuff like that, but – you know, there's not a lot. There's no summer league. There's no incorporating rookies or anything like that. Like, we're just ready to roll. Last time the NBA was rolling, this was the best team. They won the championship. They cruised through the playoffs. And now they just get to hop back out there and keep doing it again. I think the Lakers, I, I think this could be an advantage for them. I don't think it really matters because I don't think that, you know, I think you obviously see LeBron and AD kind of not get, like, the load management like Kawhi, but some of that, and then have them ready for the playoffs. And regardless of whether they're 
one, two, three in the West at the end of the year, like they'll be my favorites to come out. Assuming, you know, everything's basically the same. Uh, the West is really deep and good though, because man, Golden State looms. Absolutely. Like they got the number two pick in the draft also. So they could potentially make a move for one of those big time veterans. If they did that, I mean, maybe they get a, I mean, the other thing is like, how often does a, a dynasty like this get a chance to pick top five? I know that it's not a great draft, but they could potentially hit on the draft pick and just extend their run. I mean, absolutely. And if I can find a way to move that pick and or Wiggins or Draymond Green, right. like if somebody's willing to part, you know, with Devin Booker or something like that, like if there's another player I can bring in, can you imagine like running Booker? Or Clay, move Clay Thompson down to the three, and then having Booker, Steph Curry, and Clay Thompson. I could not. I'm interested to see how Curry and Clay Thompson specifically are. Uh, you know, they're kind of getting forgotten about, and like they're really good. There aren't many players like top five guys that like kind of get slept on, and I feel like Steph is one of them. Yeah, I keep I hear a lot about the Warriors the last few days. I know a lot of okay. people are excited to see them back, and they should be really good again. I'm not gonna lie, man. The bottom of the West, the whole West is is really exciting. I even look at Minnesota, you know, with D'Angelo Russell, Carl Anthony Towns, and the number one pick. Like another team, they could move that number one pick. Russell and Towns, while that that might not equal a ton of wins, is going to be fun to watch if they can get some defensive stability in there. Watch out, and then New Orleans. Like I haven't even heard much Zion talk. Maybe he's ready to take the next step. I don't know. We've liked Sacramento. Is Brandon Ingram going to end up back there? Yeah, right? Like Memphis with John Morant. Man, the West is loaded. This is a great time for the NBA. We're talking about the non-playoff teams here. Yeah, and then you got the Spurs. You should probably just blow this shit up and try to move. You You know, you want nothing to do with DeMar DeRozan or LaMarcus Aldridge anymore. Well, the other teams, you really see a future except for the Spurs. I mean, the Kings almost seem like they need to step their game up. Like a couple of years ago, they looked in prime position. Now, aside from the Spurs, I basically like all the other teams' futures more than the Kings. A big part of that is Bagley being nothing. Well, he's a dead spot that's always hurt, right? We, I know you're a big fan of his, and you really got me appreciating his game, but you got to be on the court to be viable. He's not on the court, man. Like they chose him over Luka. That hurts. Yeah, I mean, that's a team that's exciting, the Dallas Mavericks. I'm curious to watch them, too, like – I mean, the right piece added to this. Uh, this could be it. I mean, especially if we can get another year of Porzingis being healthy, them working together, get Luca to focus on his defense even just the slightest little bit. I mean, Luca is – gets sick. Yeah, man. Like, I think there could be a lot of changing in the guard in the West here, though. Like, OKC is not going to make the playoffs. We don't know what they're going to do with their roster, but I don't expect them to. Utah – I'm not sure about Donovan Mitchell is, is very exciting. Interested to see what they do with the rest of their roster. Also, they were missing Bogdanovich for their playoff run, which hurt them for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, man, the West has a bunch. I'm, I'm really interested to see what John Morant can do. And then Phoenix, I'm hyped for the NBA, especially the West. Yeah, Phoenix was a ton of fun in the bubble. But, I mean, if things are true and Booker doesn't want to be there, and, you know, the guy who's by far your best player has no interest in being there. That's not good. No, it's not good. I mean, Booker yeah, I, is. Go ahead. What, I was say, Booker is the kind of guy that, I mean, there are so many teams that I think that if you added him, depending on what you gave up, like he is a guy, just he's a bucket getter down the stretch. He's a decent passer. God defend him for three, but he's not relying on the three point shot. He still has that mid range game, you know, you know, clutch moments. He's a situ, you know, a guy that you can add to your team. Like, there's so many teams that I think that if they added Devin Booker, like they would vault right away, like just right up into the stratosphere. I agree. He's a difficult one because, like, first thought, I'm like Phoenix cannot deal him because they're not going to get anyone as good as him. But on the other hand, like, they've been. I mean, Booker has not translated to wins for them. Last year in the bubble Correct. was the best they ever played with him. So it wouldn't be like the craziest thing in the world for them to deal him. I just think it would be stupid because they're not going to get anyone that's as good as him. And it's only a move that they should make if he's like really like, I want out. Well, the difference between Booker and Giannis for me is, you know, Milwaukee is a couple of balls bouncing the other way away, you know, from 
going places. I love Devin Booker, but you're right. They have done nothing with him outside of, you know, a couple of nice weeks in the bubble last year. It hasn't translated to wins. I don't think any of us put that on him. But this has been a dysfunctional franchise for a long time that, I mean, imagine how good this guy would be if he was playing for, like, a real team. Yeah, exactly. But it goes back to, I can't remember who I was talking about before, but, like, he's just not, like, he's a top 15 player. You know, you could argue maybe higher than that. But he's not one of these guys that's just going to carry his team to, like, the NBA Finals. I mean, there's, there's only a couple of them. I mean, even Giannis, who I think is, like, one of those guys, his team hasn't made the NBA Finals. No. Um, I mean, LeBron is, you know, the only but, guy I really think of that you go to the Finals because he's on your team. Yes, but I'm more I'm, I'm saying, like, Giannis' teams, even though they haven't had the playoff success, like, they're winning, like, 50 plus games every year because of him. You know, I know yeah. they have a good team around him, but you know, the Suns are not that team at all. No, they are mismanaged. They make a lot of bad decisions. Um, they have just have not been winners. And I, I would like to see Devin Booker freed and end up somewhere else. And the difference between him and Drew Holiday is I think Holiday needs to be on the right team. I mean, I think Booker, he kind of fits anywhere. Yeah, I agree. I mean, he's just so what the NBA is about right now. Uh, he's a great shooter. He's great off the dribble. He's kind of positionless. I agree. Um, like, I'd love to see him paired up with Ben Simmons. Yeah, I've heard that as a possible swap, actually, Booker for Simmons. Well, I would like them together because Simmons is not going to be your, you know, you just run the offense through Simmons for 46 minutes. You know, Booker can be out there spreading the floor. Now I need a bucket the last two minutes. Well, now let's run the offense through Devin Booker. You know, Simmons takes his minutes off on the bench. And then I'll build around you as shooters and defensive players. I mean, that basically goes to our point that, like, Simmons is like a mini. Simmons is like. Yes, exactly. So, like, Booker with Westbrook would be really good also. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um Hmm. God, I'm getting excited now. Can we now. talk about Booker, though? Like, I think Bradley Beal is, like, a lot of the same as Booker. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I just don't see Booker getting – I mean, I, I don't think – I think Beal is, like, he is what he is right now. Like, Booker's several years younger. I think, like, we could see him emerge, like, if we see him on a better team. As, you know, you said top 15. I mean, I think, you know, top 10 player – in real arguments here, like scoring title type of stuff. It's so interesting, Beal, like, because we've also made the point, like, put other guys in that situation in Washington and they're going to have really good numbers. But he, oh, when he was with Wall, like, not that he was a non factor, but he was more than fine being like the second fiddle to Wall. Like, Wall was the guy, not even a question. No one, if you paid attention to the NBA and DFS fantasy at that point, no one was saying Beal was the guy over Wall. Yeah, I'm a, we're Bradley Beal fans. And I'm trying to think, like, what would be the best place for him right now? Denver. Would you move Michael Porter Jr. to get him? I would. So would I. I also think that there's probably better spots because he is a lot like Murray. He is. But I'm Jamal Murray, Bradley Beal, and Nikola Jokic. And just, I mean, at that point, move Porter. I mean, I mean, I feel like you held on to Gary Harris right there just for his defense and everything like that. So you got Murray, Harris, Beal, Jokic, and then now we got to fill in the four. Yeah. Um, I mean, yes, that team is, it would be pretty damn good. Man, I'm getting fired up for the NBA right now. I'm with you, though. The Thunder. It was a fun story last year. They need to rebuild. Yeah. I wonder what's going to happen with Chris Paul. Like, that's a realistic piece Milwaukee should go after, uh, whether trade or whatever, because Oklahoma City's in full rebuild. Like, he helps you a lot this year. All of a sudden, you add Chris Paul, like, to the minute to Milwaukee. I mean, they could win the title this year, in my opinion. Yeah. If they're, again, this is where my lack of capology experience isn't going to help, but like, are we able to swap Bledsoe somehow in this? Because those are two overpaid guys that 
I agree. Paul's a much better fit for Milwaukee right now. One, because he can shoot still. He's a better leader. Yeah. Even though he's not a champion, he still has more experience in the playoffs and doesn't come up small necessarily like that. Now he's always hurt, so that's a big, you know, a big if right there. But I also don't think you have you don't have to push right. him in the regular season in Milwaukee. Was, like the dude can play twenty eight minutes a game. I was just about to say that you do not need him in the regular season. You've got Giannis for all those regular season wins, and he does even better what you just talked about than like Booker. Like he can control the offense in like the last five minutes of the fourth quarter. Better than just about anyone. You know, obviously I'd rather have Booker, Beal, than Chris Paul. But, man, the fit for Milwaukee is great for Paul. And it's, he's just, you know, easier to get because Booker and Beal are, Beal are, like, young, you know? Yeah. I'd give up basically anything but Middleton to get Chris Paul from Milwaukee. Yeah, that's the problem. If you give up from Middleton and now it, well, it, it's not like – like you said, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. You're not really necessarily getting any better. But if you could somehow work like Bledsoe, DiVincenzo, and literally anything else that they want into this deal because Milwaukee does not have a lot of assets because no. Brooke Lopez has more value on Milwaukee than he does anywhere else. So people aren't exactly lining up to get him. Bledsoe's the guy that's dispensable, but his trade value is super, super low. And then Dante DiVincenzo is like the one young player that like, I would I think like DiVincenzo, he'd fit anywhere, right? Like he's a nice piece, but he's also not a needle mover. Right. That's exactly what I was going to say. Like, I like DiVincenzo a lot, but like, I don't think he's in the same stratosphere as like Tyler Hero in terms of their trade value. And I think that that's a big, not a big problem, but a problem that Milwaukee has is like their young talent. DiVincenzo is good, and I think that teams want him. But, like, DJ Wilson, you know, he's in nothing. I don't think you could move him for anything. No. And it's like they don't have any assets. No, they don't. And the draft picks aren't anything special, right? Like, DiVincenzo's an asset, but he's not – people aren't lining up like, dude, we got to get DiVincenzo from Milwaukee. Every team right. – all 31 other teams would like him. But right. Nobody's, like, going out of their way to get him. Exactly. So, like, yeah, I'm wondering, like, does Oklahoma City want – like a package of Bledsoe, DiVincenzo for Chris Paul. Like, could they not get better than that? I guess is my question. Maybe. I mean, with his contract, though, who's really lining up for Chris Paul? No one. Chris Paul, like, what's he making next year? $195 billion or something like that? No, I'm with you there. So that's why it might potentially be like a perfect fit. Yeah. You're like, you know, you're trading contracts with Bledsoe, but then also giving up a, a nice piece in DiVincenzo, which – all Oklahoma City really cares about. Look, that that makes sense to me. And Bledsoe's a nice regular season player still. He'll help you be competitive in some games. Um, you know, you run him and shine the backcourt and for the time being. You're not going to be pathetic, at least. No. Um, I mean, if I'm Oklahoma City, I feel like... I guess one guy I'm interested to see is what they do with his Schroeder. I, he's good. I think he could help. he's a guy that can help a lot of teams. Yeah, uh, I would agree with that as well. Uh, they're an interesting team, but you're right. They're just one of those teams that's stuck in limbo right now. Like you have, You're nowhere close to being championship relevant, uh, but you've been too good to like get those draft picks that you want. And so I, I think you blow up as much as you can. You set yourself up in the best situation cap-wise possible. Uh, you build around Shy and kind of go from there. You build around Shy, and you got all those picks from the Clippers. So – you know, they're not great picks, but all you need to do is hit on one, you know? Yeah, like we both like Dennis Schroeder. But again, he's not a major needle mover. Teams aren't lining up to get him. But what can you get for a deal with some of these guys and know that you're probably going to be crappy next year? But you're okay with that. Give me a better draft pick. Shy, yes. to me, is, you know, he's got star potential. I won't go as far as superstar, but I think he's got real potential. Yeah, I mean, I think he's got a potential to be, like, on the same level as the guys we've talked about. as like, his ceiling. Like, he's not nowhere close to there yet. He's, Took a big step up last year, right? He's, yeah, he's obviously not, like, a LeBron-type guy. I mean, those guys are rare, though. Like, very rare. So, very like, rare. Like, extremely rare. I mean, I, when I say that, though, I mean, like, Giannis and Kawhi. You know, like, the top of the top. Sure. I don't just mean LeBron. But, yeah. Uh, I mean... I think that the Clippers obviously made a bad deal. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, uh, one rumor I heard. Oh, yeah. What do you think about this potential, like, 
you know, just one for one. Paul George for Drew Holiday. George and Kawhi just aren't a fit. Well, we talked about this at the end of the season last year. Paul George is about as mentally weak as a star as there is. And Kawhi, whatever the reasons for his body might be, like he's really physically weak. So you saw down the stretch, Paul George was couldn't get out of his own head. And Kawhi was running around like that 50-year-old guy you see at the YMCA who's overweight, who just, he can't get his breath back. There's no legs on his jump shot or anything like that. Those dudes didn't want to be there. Uh, I'm not saying I don't think those guys could work. I just, you can't give me a physically weak and a mentally weak star and put them together. I mean, it's hard to pick them to beat like AD and LeBron next year. Right? I but mean, that, again, that's also recency bias by all it of is. us too, because they, they were, did not want to be in the bubble. So I'm, I'm curious to see what that would look like on a regular season. That's fair. Um, I got no argument for that because we'll have to wait and see. But if I'm them and I can get something good for Paul George and Kawhi signs off on it, I'm oh. making it. Don't you think Paul George, though, like his trade value is like right there with Eric Bledsoe's as low as it could possibly be? Yeah, I do. And I also think like this is part of the problem. Like you gave up so much to get him, man. You know, Kawhi wants him there, obviously. Like, it's not as easy as just dealing him either. So, yeah, I don't, I, I, I just can't see that being the right move for him. And again, I'm probably as hard on Paul George as anybody, but, you know, before they got to the bubble, they were the team or one of the teams to beat. And I think they were the, you know, the favorite in Vegas. And there is something, like we said going into the bubble, that it's an even playing field for everybody, right? Everybody's stuck in the same situation. That being said, it did not affect every team the same way. Jimmy Butler took it as a business trip, and his team excelled in the situation. The Clippers didn't want to be there. And that for whatever reason, you take it. As, I agree. I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, not everybody has the mental fortitude of LeBron James and Jimmy Butler, though. And Clearly, maybe it's different in a regular season. Maybe. Um, maybe. Let's, I, maybe. I, yeah, we don't know. Um, Man, I'm interested to see like how the Clippers are next year. You know, they also need, you know, a point guard, as everybody's pointed out. Like, you can't just be Kawhi doing everything on the offensive perspective. Uh, they need somebody who can kind of run and facilitate the offense a little bit. And Patrick Beverly is a wonderful defender, but he's not a great point guard. Um, Lou Williams was not himself in the bubble. Montrez Harrell was not himself in the bubble. That Things got yeah, right? Things got way worse for Paul George. He's already kind of a mentally weak guy who's not great in clutch situations, but he clearly didn't want to be there. Kawhi looked even more out of shape than normal. Yeah, it was pretty sad. Um, it was pretty sad for sure. Those Kawhi jump shots in the third and fourth quarter of that last game against Denver, those things were so flat. Like, he was not in shape. Yeah. And you want to know what? If you're not willing to take care of your body like LeBron James and you can only play two out of three games, like I don't really feel bad for you either. No, same. Um, especially when we saw some other really like impressive performances, like the team I'm about to get to, Utah. What do you think they can do next year? Coming off that really impressive eh, that really impressive playoff performance. I know they lost against Denver, but they were big dogs going into that series. They got up three one. They didn't have Bogdanovich, as I mentioned. Donovan Mitchell's another guy that took a big, big step. He's right almost on that Beal Booker teal tier. He's not as good of a shooter as those guys, but when his three ball is dropping, he's unstoppable. Man, I don't know. Like I might I might take him if I had a bread of the Beal. Really? Yeah. I, I was impressed by him in, in the bubble. I was and I've never been as big of a Mitchell fan as you have, but he showed me a lot in the bubble. And I was impressed. So I, I don't think he Utah is a team that I would consider like is even like a 1% possibility to make it to like the finals. But Donovan yeah. Mitchell showed me a lot and I don't know what their next moves are, but uh, I'm a bigger fan than I was six months ago. Man, just going through this video, there are so many good players in the NBA. Like this is one of the best times for the NBA right now. You just think about, we haven't even brought up Dame yet. Like I was just looking at Portland. Like, literally, I haven't even brought him up one time on this video. And, I mean, he's awesome. Like, Portland's another one of these teams. I I cannot see them, you know, 
really going in the upper echelon of the West. I'll say this about Dame. We've talked about these guys, you know, Booker, Beal. He's one step ahead of those guys, in my opinion. He's right. not he's not like LeBron, obviously, or Giannis, but he's right on the Harden level, basically, in my opinion. So Portland is stuck in the situation that they also need to blow it up. Yeah, it's just got- not as currently constructed. It's just not going to ever win anything major. I think you have Dame right now as like an all-time sell-high candidate, although he – can you move on from him? Because Portland isn't exactly wrapping up or racking in the superstars, and he's really good. But as currently constructed, I see no path to a championship with him. I still don't think you can move on from Dame because I think that not winning a title – like I, I, like Dame is, you know, they've made the playoffs a lot. He's like, arguably could go down as Portland's best player ever. So I don't think that like they could never deal him. But I think the more logical, you know, thing would be to try to deal McCollum, who I think has high trade value also. I mean, if Philly's really trying to blow it up, I've heard McCollum and pieces for Embiid. I mean, I'm making that move if I'm Portland. I just thought McCollum the- would be a great fit for my Bucks. I just don't know what they can great. give up to get him. I don't see the Bucs being interested in that like package from Milwaukee, which is basically what the package is. I think they yeah. view McCollum as like a – I don't view McCollum as like on the Beal level. We keep going back to this. I keep going back to it. But I think that that's like what he's viewed in the league. What's your take there? Do you think he's on the Booker, Beal, Mitchell level? See, I think where we just – we're a little – I think you think Beal's better than I think he is. Okay, Fair. Uh, I really like Bradley Beal, and I think he's a very good player. But he's another one of these guys that, I don't know, doesn't translate to wins. That's true. I mean, so, I mean, I like Beal, but I think of Beal and McCollum as about the same level. Okay, and they're not quite on, your, on like Booker's level for you. I think because like Booker is real young still. He's been playing for a dysfunctional franchise. I think his ceiling is higher than either of those players. And I could be wrong, but that's just how I feel about it. Right now, I think all those guys are similar. Okay. And I can't really argue that point. I just think if I told you that Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, or CJ McCollum was a final three MVP candidate or was number two in scoring for the season, for me, like – and I had to pick one, and it was like pick behind door number two. Like I would pick Devin Booker; it wouldn't even be close. I would pick Booker, but I also think like you could make the argument that Bo is better than McCollum. Yeah, I don't. I mean, that's. You know, I'm sure you're right. No, maybe I can't I, argue that. Maybe I'm too high on Bo. I just, regardless, those guys are similar, and I think that Portland could potentially get a lot from McCollum. Is the ultimate point. Yeah, I would love McCollum to be on Milwaukee. <laughs> we just don't have the right piece to get him. Agreed. Um, with you 100%. And then you've also got teams creeping. I mean, I know I mentioned them in passing, but one team I think is going to take a big step is Memphis. I think they got a good foundation there. I think John Morant has a chance to be special. Like, I'm, like he's a point guard, but I think he could be really, really special. And they have another good, you know, they've got other good pieces in Jaron Jackson. Uh, what's your take on Memphis? What do they need? I still think they need a lot. Um you know, I like Jaron Jackson. I like Dylan Brooks. I like Jonas, and I like all these guys. But there's, to me, they're still a long ways away from being in the same conversation as even like a Denver Nuggets team. That's fair. I mean, they definitely need more pieces. But, you know, we talked about it. Like, Portland's not winning a title with this team. I'd rather have Memphis's roster for the future than Portland. Check back on me with that for this year. I want to see John Moran play for another season. That's fair. Uh, I like the kid. Impressive. Needs to work on his outside shot a little bit, but, you know, that's pretty typical for young players of his caliber. Uh, He's very good. I mean, he's a very, very, very good young player, but I don't love their roster quite yet. Uh, I feel that. Uh, And, again, I would take – I would still take Dame right now, even at however many years older, over John Morant because – I can only plan for a couple years into the future anyway. So you would take like, obviously for this year, you would take Lillard, but if you were like starting a team, you'd take Lillard over Morant? Yeah, because I still think you got five good years with Lillard at least. And I I struggle to plan much farther ahead than that in the future, especially in the NBA. 
I get that. I mean, I got no arguments there. So, um, as far as some of like the oh, let's you know, as far as some of like the free agents, like I, I hear keep hearing Boston's trying to move on from Gordon Hayward. Yeah, I heard he kind of wants out too. And I I get that because they have too many wings. You know, you got Kemba, you got Jalen Brown, you got Jason Tatum. I I just don't know that he really has a place right there. And like they would be better served by getting a big man. Yeah, agreed. Um, I've heard like potential Hayward for Oladipo swap also. Those doesn't really make any sense to me. Agreed. Like you're just you're trading one wing player who's a hybrid, who's a good shooter but not great, good passer not great. I I don't I don't man, it just doesn't do anything for me. I don't think it changes either team. I agree. I mean, I think it's just a more of a clusterfuck in Boston. You know, where would Hayward make a lot of sense? I don't even know. Back in Utah. Maybe. He's getting paid a lot of money. A lot of money. Way too much money. Yeah. Not as much money as Paul Millsap was getting overpaid, but that seems to be done and over. Mm-hmm. Uh, nobody's taking a bigger cut right now than Paul Millsap as far as what they're getting paid next year. Yeah, this is true. This is true. Hope you saved your money, bud. <laughs> yeah, I hope so, too. Well, you're making 30 a year. You should have. Uh, what do you think DeBrosen ends up? Uh, is he, he's going to pick up his player option. Yeah, I, I know that him and San Antonio don't really sound like they have a future together. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't heard anything like he wasn't going to pick up the player option. And I mean, he looks like he's going to be making a, a a solid, solid chunk of change. So I don't think he'll pass on that. But I don't know. God, if he was a little bit more clutch, he'd be another guy that would make sense on the on the Milwaukee Bucks, right? A, a bucket getter, a guy that can get to the free throw line in a clutch situation. But he just hasn't been that dude, right? Like, I don't blame him. He's not the reason Toronto didn't win all those years, but... They didn't win all those years. I'm with you. I'll say this. I don't actually think he's that great of a fit for Milwaukee. He doesn't shoot three ball well enough. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Let's see here. I don't know. There's a, we could keep going on this one. I think we can wrap it up, though. Honestly, like, this is just getting me fired up, man, for the NBA season to start because I, we just had the World Series get over. NBA hasn't been over for that long. But the last couple of days, not having anything to do on, like, Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Friday nights and stuff, like, I've been itching for this. Yeah, it sucks. So I hope we get a lot of views on this video because then we can make more of them. So watch this video. If you're watching now, I'm sure you can watch the video. So. Watch it again. Yeah. <laughs> Watch it again, like it again, share it, subscribe. You know the deal. All right, guys. Uh, best of luck with all your DFS stuff this weekend, but we'll be back before that. Yep. Thanks, guys.